Well, welcome to our fourth installment of Pandemic. I'm Linda Kuhn, I'm Dean of the Honors College, and I'll be moderating this session. Very excited about Pandemic focused on human-animal transmission. And to lead our way today, I have two fantastic women vets. First, and who will be speaking first, is Dr. Lauren Thomas, an alumna of the Honors College, hoot, hoot, <laughs> who uh, graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Arkansas, and then went to the incredibly great land grant veterinary school at Oklahoma State University, where she got her doctorate of veterinary medicine. And Dr. Thomas is currently a faculty member in animal sciences in the wonderful Bumpers College here at the University of Arkansas. She's also a vet, but she teaches a whole series of really hip classes. In fact, I'm thinking I would like to take some of these. Comparative veterinary anatomy, companion animal nutrition, respiratory psychology, uh, physiology and renal physiology, in addition to basic intros to animal science. And Dr. Thomas will be followed by Dr. Laura Rothfeld. Unknown participant is now joining. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Dr. Rothfeld is a state public health veterinarian for the Arkansas Department of Health since 2018. And she also did her veterinary work at Oklahoma State University, which has a fine vet school. She spent time in the Army as a field veterinarian for the U.S. Army. And she's had a whole series of super interesting jobs, which I'm hoping she might say a few things about. But she also did some time as an Epidemic Intelligence Service fellow, fellow for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So today, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Rothfeld are gonna take us through this complicated story of human-animal transmission. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Thomas first. Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, thank you guys for having me today. Um, as Dr. Kuhn mentioned, my name is Dr. Lauren Thomas, and I am uh, a faculty member um, here on campus at the U of A uh, over in the Department of Animal Science. And I do teach quite the variety of classes. Um, and so my goal today really is to introduce you guys to zoonotic diseases. Um, this may be a novel concept to many of you, and certainly it is a, a hot topic right now. So when we talk about diseases that are potentially transmissible between animals and humans, the technical term for that um, is zoonotic. And so zoonotic diseases can be spread through uh, or from domesticated animals, such as pets, and livestock um, to humans, and then also through wildlife to humans. And clearly right now, um, the big discussion with COVID-19 is the transmission from, the potential transmission from wildlife uh, to humans. Now, my background as a veterinarian, before I came to the University of Arkansas, I actually was in clinical practice or private practice for veterinarians. So a lot of my perspective that I'm gonna bring to you today revolves around those diseases that are found within domesticated uh, animals, domesticated pets and livestock. Just to give you kind of a broad overview so that we're that we realize that the world of zoonotic diseases is bigger uh, than just COVID-19. And then I also want to introduce the concept of reverse zoonosis. And there's another big fancy hard to say, say word uh, that describes that, uh, but we'll just leave it at reverse zoonosis. And so this would be the concept of an infection passing from a human back to an animal or a human to an animal. So the majority of the things that I'm going to talk about are animal to human transmission, because that's the majority of what we deal with. But of course, with COVID-19, and as Dr. Rothfeld um, is going to touch on in her portion of the um, the conversation is the fact that there is a little bit of concern now about COVID-19 uh, going from humans to animals. So approximately 60% of all human infectious diseases today are considered zoonotic. So over half uh, of the infectious diseases that we deal with. And then up to 75% of emerging human pathogens 
are considered zoonotic. So zoonotic diseases are a big deal and definitely not uh, something to be ignored. But why? Why are they such, um, such a concern? Why are they so prevalent? And the answer is found just in <clears throat> the development of the human uh, population over time. So agriculture is really the stimulus behind modern urbanization that we that we live in today. So agriculture has made uh, the lifestyles that we lead today possible. Well, agriculture started with the domestication of animals. So taking wild animals and genetically or not really intentionally, uh, maybe genetically selecting like we think of today, but selecting animals for desirable traits that we want to have perpetuated in future generations. And so that's where domestic domesticated animal species come from. It's that intentional selection of animals over time by man to create a species that is genetically unique from what we see in the wild. And so as a result, man through agriculture has developed close relationships with certain types of animals. And that's mainly the ones that we consider our pets and our domestic livestock. Also, as urbanization has increased, man's interest in having animals as pets has increased. And so automatically, even though majority of us don't live on farms um, anymore, we still have close contact with animals and that potentially poses a risk uh, for jumping of infectious agents from one species to another. Also, man's adventurous nature uh, and just the global economy that we live in um, and the amount of travel that people do automatically predisposes us uh, to more interactions with potentially zoonotic pathogens. And then, of course, there's the increase uh, of man's influence on wildlife habitats. Um, so all of these things combined put us in closer contact with these different species that potentially can pass infections to us. So what are some ways that people can get zoonotic diseases? Well, the main way is direct contact. Um, that could be through inhalation, so breathing in those respiratory droplets um, that everybody keeps talking about, or maybe through an open wound. That would be a direct way for an infectious agent to get into the body. Uh, feces, urine, saliva, all those things that come from animals potentially could get into the human body and as a result, transmit disease into the human body. Another way that we talk about a lot over in the agricultural animal science side is foodborne pathogens. So it's no secret that there are certain infectious agents that can be presented in undercooked products, undercooked meat or undercooked dairy products, or maybe even just wild game if you're a hunter. And then there's the vector-borne category. Um, this is an interesting category. It's one that we deal with a lot here in Arkansas, and this is the transmission of disease from insects to animals and also to people. So there's a lot of diseases out there that we as people can get from insect bites that our pets can also get or that our animals can also get. And so we see parallels there uh, with the two different types uh, of diseases that are caused by essentially the same organism. It's just an organism that's passed through an insect of some sort. So my goal today is to try to introduce you to a variety of different zoonotic pathogens. And so I've, I've, the subtitle to my, my presentation is from prions to parasites. So basically the simplest type of infectious agent all the way up to uh, the most complex and everything in between. So today we're gonna touch on bacterial zoonotic diseases, fungal zoonotic diseases, parasitic, uh, prions, this is an interesting one that we'll talk about, protozoa, and then last but not least, I'll talk about viruses. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Rothfeld because that's really what you guys are probably most interested in today, and she'll be able to go into more detail on that. Now, everything that I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be pretty, pretty fast and furious. And so I don't expect, and my goal is certainly not to make you an expert um, at each of these diseases, but again, to just expose you or introduce you to the idea uh, that these diseases exist and potentially can affect both animals and humans. So if you want more information on what I talk about today, you can go to the Merck Veterinary Manual, which is available online for free. It's a great, very accurate, 
accurate, uh, trustworthy resource. If you're interested in learning about these pathogens from the veterinary standpoint, if you're interested in looking at it from the human standpoint, I would highly recommend the CDC website. Um, they have got a lot of good thorough information there that is right at your fingertips. A couple of scientific literature articles. If you're uh, interested in looking at the literature reviews, I've got a, pub a couple that are posted there for you as well. Now, Again, I'm going to present quite a few things in the next few minutes, and, and so I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I just want you to sit back and enjoy and just try to absorb uh, what you can, and then also realize that the things I talk about today are not an exhaustive list uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's just a few uh, diseases that I chose to highlight for each category. So there are other diseases out there other than the ones that I have listed here today that would be considered zoonotic. So the first category that we're gonna look at is zoonotic bacteria. And salmonella is one that you've probably heard of before. So salmonella is a gram-negative rod bacteria that is considered a facultative an anaerobe, meaning it can function in both an oxygen environment and a non-oxygen environment. And typically it is passed from animal to animal or from animals to humans through fecal oral transmission. So somehow fecal material gets on a person's hands, maybe if they're out working with animals or if the animal uh, defecates and they have to clean it up off of a surface and then they fail to wash their hands. That's a classic way of getting it. But certainly animals can pass it to each other in the environment just through their excrement. And so this bacteria causes severe enteritis or inflammation of the intestine um, and can also lead to septicemia. So that's a blood infection that goes all throughout the body. Food producing animals are most often affected by salmonella. And in fact, some can be asymptomatic carriers. And so that poses a problem uh, for uh, workers uh, that work with these animals and then for the food industry as well. And so as a result, it is really important uh, to make sure that we take measures to prevent uh, these asymptomatic carriers and then also prevent the potential transmission of this bacteria through the products that will be consumed by humans. And so this would be eggs meat and maybe even dairy products. So undercooked meat, unpasteurized milk um, and raw eggs can all be sources of salmonella that can come from animals originally, but then end up infecting people. In humans, we call salmonella infection or we refer to it as typhoid fever. So you may have heard about it before in some of your other classes. Another example of a zoonotic bacteria is called leptospirosis. Um, and I put just leptospirosis species up there just like I did with the salmonella because there's a variety of different species of each of these categories. Um, and so we're just looking at them generally today. But leptospirosis is also a gram negative organism. Um, it is technically considered a spirochete because if you look at it under the microscope um, or it looks like a little spiral. And that's what that picture there um, on the right is showing you. It is an obligate aerobe, meaning it requires oxygen. And it is commonly shed in the urine and the milk of animals that are infected with it. As a result, it can cause hepatitis, it can cause renal disease or kidney disease, and even abortion um, in animals that get it. Uh-oh. We seem to have lost our presentation. I think somebody might have accidentally shared their screen. Yeah, they did. Let's see. Make sure. Yeah, yeah, go ahead with that. Okay, you're back. Can you get it back up or you want me to do it? Um, why don't you do it? I bet you would be faster than me. Oh, now I've lost it too. Ah. Just a second, sorry. That's okay. It'll be just 
a moment. Here we go. Yay. All right, am I clear to take control? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and if we could just remind everybody to be careful um, in the presentation. All right, let's see if we can get back. Okay, so I believe this is where we left off with. So talking about leptospirosis, um, it's common in tropical uh, regions and also provo provides a seasonal threat in temperate climate. So where we live here in the United States, uh, we are classified as a temperate climate. So this time of year right now with all this rain and with it starting to warm up, this is the perfect time uh, for animals to contract leptospirosis. Uh, it's harbored in wildlife populations. So just about any small mammal uh, that you can imagine running through your yard um, or across your farm could potentially potentially be carrying leptospirosis. And so there is a vaccine available uh, for this disease. Uh, a lot of uh, small animal vet clinics will offer this vaccine uh, for dogs specifically. And so it is highly recommended because if your dog were to get infected with leptospirosis, the organism could be shed in the dog's urine. And then when you go to clean up the accident um, or maybe inadvertently come into contact with the dog's urine, you yourself could become infected and it could cause uh, hepatitis, renal disease and other issues. Um, so this is one that when I was in practice, um, I would commonly recommend uh, vaccination for. I should also back up and say there is also a salmonella vaccine out there. So for animals that are in high risk situations, uh, maybe production type situations, uh, that would be a vaccine that producers would consider. Um, another side note um, on salmonella, uh, I mentioned poultry products um, as a common source uh, of the, the bacteria. And my friends love to remind me not to kiss my chickens. So I do have backyard chickens uh, here at my house um, that are basically pets, uh, but they do lay eggs. Uh, and the CDC did put out a warning um, a few years back, uh, warning people not to kiss their chickens because of the risk of salmonella. So just some, just some thoughts for you. One that you might not have heard of before is called brucella. Um, it causes brucellosis um, in several different domesticated uh, species. It's also a gram-negative uh, bacteria, technically a coccobacillus. Uh, it is an aerobe, and um, it is acquired through ingestion of infected bodily fluids or tissues. Uh, and they can also sometimes in some species be transmitted uh, venereally or through, through a sexual interaction. And so this bacteria is known to cause abortion in several of our animal species, and it is commonly shed in the fetal membranes and raw milk of those animals that are infected. And so one interesting thing about ruminants, this would be cattle and sheep and goats uh, that you might not be aware of, but it is normal for those animals to actually eat their placentas. So after they have a baby, uh, the placenta will be passed onto the ground and the animal will actually eat it because in order to uh, help clean up any scent uh, that might be left behind that a predator might be attracted to, uh, they eat it. Um, um, so that it's not there anymore. So we deal with brucella in large livestock and then also sometimes in dogs. In livestock, brucella or brucellosis has been referred to as Bangs disease um, in years past. Um, the uh, United States undertook or the USDA undertook a significant uh, effort many years ago to try to eradicate brucellosis uh, from our animal populations. And so they did um, a series of aggressive uh, testing um, and programs in the United States starting in the 1950s. And then finally, uh, in 2008, I believe Texas was the last state to be declared brucellosis free. So we don't hear as much about brucellosis anymore, um, but it is still present in wild ruminant herds. So this would be your deer and your elk population. So think about all the cattle that are out on the fields um, and the deer and the elk that might be lingering nearby. And so there is that potential for brucellosis to come back again um, and then certainly pose a threat to humans. Uh, we do know, and Dr. Rothfeld actually uh, told me this, 
um, is that there has been brucellosis detected in feral hogs in Arkansas. Um, so a lot of people um, like to hunt feral hogs. They're actually kind of a nuisance species uh, for farmers. And so people can get licenses to hunt them. Um, and then if they harvest them, you can potentially come into contact with brucellosis uh, through that process. And so PPE or protective wear is recommended if you're going to be hunting and harvesting. In humans, brucellosis causes a recurrent or undulant fever. Um, so people that contract the disease uh, become very, uh, fever. they will have this kind of recurrent fever that makes them feel bad. Now just a few more um, here just to mention. Uh, chlamydia. So automatically when I say chlamydia you automatically think of the sexually transmitted disease and while I want you to know that there's other species of chlamydia out there uh, that are found in our animals uh, and are not necessarily uh, sexually transmitted um, and so in small ruminants we have uh, C. abortus and pecorum in birds it's uh, chlamydia psittaci and then in cats it's chlamydia felis and these bacteria and this bacteria in these species mainly causes abortion and respiratory disease. Um, so it's not the venereal disease that we talk about in humans, but certainly the respiratory disease that we see um, in these species can be passed back to humans. And so humans can develop uh, symptoms of these other types of chlamydia. Mycobacterium, you may have heard of tuberculosis before or TB. So mycobacterium species can cause tuberculosis in cattle. And so as a result, um, there has been widespread uh, TB testing of cattle because certainly as the bacteria builds in the respiratory tract of the cow, um, if the cow were to cough or to sneeze and the workers around that cow uh, could be at risk for contracting tuberculosis, which is very contagious uh, amongst people. And so here in the U.S., we've done a really good job um, of getting it under control. So it's not as big of a threat here, but it is still a potential threat. And so it is not uncommon uh, for certain states to require TB testing of cattle, especially before cattle enter or leave the state. Yersinia pestis is the bacteria that causes plague. I know some of our guest speakers um, are going to be talking about just the history of the plagues um, that have affected human populations over time. So uh, Yersinia pestis is the organism or the bacteria that causes <clears throat> this. We find it in dogs, cats, rodents, and rabbits. Um, when I went through vet school, the common uh, species that was often talked about was prairie dogs because um, there was a period of time where people thought it was fun and cool to keep prairie dogs as pets and so as a result exposure to Yersinia pestis increased and people contracted uh, plague as a result. It is transmitted by fleas though so you have to be bitten by a flea that has been on a dog, a cat, or a rodent of some sort uh, that is carrying the disease and so it's not this is what we would consider a vector-borne uh, disease where it has to go through the flea you can't just hold the rabbit or hold the prairie dog and automatically get infected, you would have to be bitten by a flea. And it is more common in uh, the southwestern United States. Francisella tularensis, this is the organism that causes tularemia. Uh, sheep are highly susceptible to it. Uh, dogs and cats and rabbits can get it as well. This one is also a vector-borne bacteria that is transmitted by ticks uh, to and from these different species and then also uh, to humans. Uh, ingestion of infected wild game is another way that people can get tularemia. Uh, so we do have cases of tularemia here in Arkansas, and so that is something to be aware of. And so uh, proper flea and tick prevention is super important in your dogs and cats. And then the last one I'm going to mention here is Bacillus anthracis, or the organism that causes anthrax. Uh, this is a common uh, infectious agent of cattle, especially in certain parts of the United States. West Texas is known uh, for having this organism in the soil, um, and so it causes acute death in cattle, um, and it can, it can uh, cause failure of the blood to clot, and so people can get exposed um, when they're dealing with that animal after it passes 
houses, or maybe even in the slaughterhouses, um, if the animal hasn't died yet, but somehow uh, made it into a slaughterhouse, um, consum so consumption of undercooked meat could be a potential source of infection. So again, one of the things that we talk about a lot in animal science for prevention of some of these zoonotic diseases is just proper preparation uh, of your protein products um, through either pasteurization or cooking to that recommended temperature in order to kill some of these potential pathogens. Next up are our fungal organisms. And so dermatophytes are a group of fungal organisms that can cause ringworm. If you grew up in uh, rural Arkansas, there's a really good chance at some point in your life you have come into contact um, or contracted ringworm. Uh, more often than not, people tend to pass ringworm back and forth between each other. So children in school settings uh, tend to be the ones uh, that pass it back and forth, but it is possible for people to get it from animals. Um, ringworm or uh, these dermatophyte species infect primarily keratinized cells or tissue. So that's that very superficial uh, layer of your skin. Um, so they don't tend to go systemic. They tend to stay right on the skin surface and they'll cause hair loss, scabbing, scaling um, on the skin. In humans, if you get it, uh, it literally forms a ring lesion on your skin and it's very itchy. Um, immunocompromised people are going to be most at risk for contracting this infection. Um, in all my years of practice, I've contracted ringworm once, and um, I know I've been exposed to it multiple, multiple times, but I've only actually gotten a lesion uh, one time. And I do think uh, that having some type of abrasion on your skin um, can predispose you to picking up the organism. So the spores are in the environment, um, and if you just happen to come into contact with some spores, either through um, contact with an animal or just, again, in the environment, and you scratch your arm just right, you can embed those, uh, those organisms onto your skin and then they can cause a superficial infection. Some other ones that maybe you've heard of before um, that are worth mentioning um, are blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, and cryptococcosis. These are common companion animal uh, fungal infections that can cause really severe uh, upper respiratory lesions, so in the sinus cavity, um, and then also pneumonia down in the lungs. Um, and what's interesting about these organisms is where we actually pick them up from and where our animals are picking them up from. So I put asterisks next to each of these because these organisms are not readily transmitted between between pets and people, so you can't pick up blasto or histo or crypto just from hugging your cat. Um, usually it's from some kind of other environmental exposure. So the spores of these bacteria, which are the infectious portions of these, um, not bacteria, excuse me, the fungal, the fungal organisms, the spores are found typically in the soil um, associated with decaying matter and or uh, bird droppings are a common place where we see histoplasmosis and cryptococcosis. So they, they kind of ride that border um, of zoonotic uh, potential. But again, hugging your cat, hugging your dog is not going to give you blasto, histo, or crypto. It's usually picking up the spores in the environment. So if your animal is getting it, so if your dog gets infected with blastomycosis or histoplasmosis, you better be on the lookout because that means it's in your environment and you could potentially be getting it or pick it up as well. Next category is our parasites. So these are kind of our more complex organisms. Uh, a few that I've picked out to talk about here are roundworms, hookworms, and sarcoptic mange. So roundworms and hookworms are super common um, in puppies and kittens. So um, a lot of puppies and kittens, uh, depending on if their mom was dewormed appropriately uh, prior to giving birth, um, a lot of puppies and kittens are actually born with these worms. Um, in the environment, adult animals can pick them up through fecal oral transmission. So going to the dog park um, and sniffing around, um, they can pick it up that way. Um, both the roundworm and the hookworm infect primarily the small intestine of the animals that they infect. 
Um, the roundworm is a commensal feeder, meaning it just eats whatever the dog or the cat is eating, um, whereas hookworms are blood feeders. They actually attach to the inside of the intestine and take a blood meal. So really severe infestations of these can cause anemia and be life-threatening um, in our pets. But in humans, um, these worms do weird things because these worms are species specific. They technically want to live in the dog or they want to live in the cat. They don't really want to live in the human, but they can end up in the human inadvertently. And it's usually small children uh, that are most at risk, again, through that fecal oral transmission. So playing out in the yard, coming into contact somehow with some fecal material, and then coming into the house, maybe eating a snack and not washing their hands. Uh, and so putting their hands to their mouth. That is the most common uh, form of transmission of these parasites to humans. But again, remember, they don't really want to be in the human. And so when they get in the human, they get confused and they don't know what to do. So instead of infecting the small intestine, they will migrate through the abdomen or they will get up into the eye and migrate um, inside the eye. And so we call that the, abdom the abdominal version, the visceral larval migrants, the baby worms are migrating, uh, causing lesions in the body and then ocular larval migrants. In hookworms, hookworms like to burrow uh, through the bottom of your feet. So if you have a pet uh, that is diagnosed with hookworms, uh, probably better pooper scoop the yard daily <laughs> until that infection is clear and not run around barefoot because those larvae uh, will persist on the blades of grass outside. And if you walk around barefoot, they can burrow up um, into the bottom of your foot. Again, not really where they want to go, but where they inadvertently end up. Sarcoptes or scabies is something maybe you've heard of. People can get this, um, but it also infects um, our pets and it causes skin lesions or hair loss on the chest, ears, elbows, and the hawks. The hawks are kind of that part of the back leg that kind of sticks out funny. And so uh, scabies are actually mites, or these, these are mange mites, and I've got one pictured there for you. He kind of looks like the Michelin man of the, of the parasite world. Uh, but these little guys crawl around on the skin um, and, and just wreak havoc and, and make the animal very itchy and make people itchy as well. Um, the mange mite that affects dogs and cats does not again want to be on the human. And so any infection that jumps from uh, animals to humans does tend to be self-limiting, but people can develop a rash that can um, last for several weeks and be uncomfortable. So in the veterinary clinics, we always wash our hands really well and warn pet owners um, if we diagnose a sarcoptic mange on their pet. Next up is our protozoa. Uh, a protozoa is just a single cell eukaryotic parasitic organism. So a, a more simplified parasite, um, if you will. And Gerardia and Toxoplasmosis are the two that we most commonly talk about um, in our veterinary species. Um, Gerardia is also known as beaver fever. Um, so people can get this when they're out hiking and camping, um, just coming into contact with contaminated water, perhaps water that's been contaminated with animal feces. Um, and it causes small intestinal malabsorption, uh, which then leads to diarrhea diarrhea, really stinky uh, diarrhea. Toxoplasmosis is one perhaps you've heard about before um, when people talk about precautions that pregnant women um, should take. And so interesting, cats are the only definitive host for toxoplasmosis, meaning that cats, the domestic cat, is the only species in which toxoplasmosis can complete its life cycle. Um, Cats will pick it up fecal orally um, through the environment, through the feces um, in, in uh, small rodents uh, that they catch and eat. And so as a result, people can come into contact uh, with it through cat feces um, and contaminated water and contaminated soil. And so that's why they tell pregnant women not to not to clean cat litter boxes, um, if at all possible, while they're pregnant or to take precautions while they're pregnant, um, because 
it's toxoplasmosis exposure is not uncommon um, in the environment. If you like to plant gardens and dig in the soil, chances are you've come into contact with toxoplasmosis. But what is interesting about it and what puts uh, uh, pregnant women most at risk is their unborn fetus. And so the, the consequences of, of contracting toxoplasmosis for the first time while you're pregnant can have devastating effects um, on, the, on the unborn fetus. And so oftentimes uh, we tell pregnant women, you don't have to get rid of your cat, just take precautions because there's no way to really know if you've been exposed or not already. And so you just don't want to take a chance for your unborn child and get exposed uh, while you're pregnant. Next up, we have the prions. And, you know, I wanted to throw these in because there's so much about prions that we don't know. And so first off, a prion, what is it? It's a misfolded protein that has the ability to influence the form and function of normal proteins, thus leading to neurodegenerative disorder and disease. So we heard about prion disease uh, back in the back in the 90s, uh, significantly with mad cow disease, AKA bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Um, and what was discovered about uh, mad cow disease um, through a lot of work that was done um, over in the UK, because that's where the majority of the diseases have been, um, is that animals were getting it through the consumption of animal-based protein in the feed. And so um, a lot of changes have been made to minimize animal protein in uh, ruminant feed. So not feeding uh, cow protein back to cows um, is one way that we can prevent or try to prevent this disease. But the truth is we don't know. We don't really know what causes these proteins to misfold, but we do know that there's a close interaction that occurs when a misfolded protein comes into close contact with normal proteins. Um, and can trigger this kind of cascade of events that can cause these proteins to start misfolding. Um, so bovine spongiform encephalopathy or med cow disease is specific to cows. Um, so we don't have any proof that it moves from cows to humans, uh, but we are we do have concerns that perhaps the consumption of tissues that are infected uh, with misfolded prions could somehow start the misfolding of proteins within the human body. In the uh, cervid populations, the wild deer and the wild elk, we do see a similar disease known as chronic wasting disease or CWD. Um, now BSE has been eradicated from the US. We currently um, really don't have have any BSE in the US, but what we do have is chronic wasting disease in our deer populations. And so that's why hunters are encouraged not to harvest deer that look unthrifty or unhealthy or maybe are staggering, kind of walking abnormally. And then also just the recommended testing of those carcasses um, after they've been harvested to make sure that they're, C, uh, they're CWD negative. Um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease would be the closest human version of a prion disease. Um, and again, it is specific to humans. Um, and so we don't know that we don't we don't have any evidence to believe that chronic wasting disease or BSE can turn into Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, but there is that potential there. And so uh, we definitely want to take precautions with our animals when we harvest them, uh, not to harvest neurologic tissue and not to consume neurologic tissue um, that could be harboring these prions. And we certainly don't want to feed that tissue uh, to our animals that we're going to harvest for human consumption. Consumption. Here's a quick map that I pulled down um, off of the Arkansas Game and Fish website that shows uh, the uh, areas of Arkansas where chronic wasting disease has been detected in cervid populations. And so I thought that would be interesting for you guys since it is so very close to Washington County, which is where we're located. So it's just uh, east of here um, over kind of towards the Buffalo River area. Last but not least, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Rothfeld, is the zoonotic viruses. Um, so what is a virus? It's a very small infectious agent uh, that contains genetic material contained within a protein capsule uh, that can only replicate inside of a host cell. So viruses have to have a host cell that they can inf infect and hijack that cell's uh, machinery in order to reproduce themselves. Uh, one of the main ones I wanted to talk to you about today was rabies. 
babies. Um, you've probably heard of this one before. If you have a dog or cat, they've hopefully been vaccinated for this, um, but it's called it's caused by a lysa virus part of the rhabdovirus family and in humans causes hydrophobia. Um, that's kind of the slang term for it because back in the day uh, when they were first studying it, people would get paralyzed from the virus and then as a result, they would lose the ability to swallow and so they would foam at the mouth and so that's where the term hydrophobia uh, came from. But rabies is an enveloped, single-stranded RNA virus. Um, it causes acute progressive uh, swelling of the brain in mammals, um, and it is fatal once clinical signs appear. So the first clinical signs of rabies are going to be changes in behavior um, that lead to uh, paralysis of some part or parts of the body, and then rapidly progress to death. So usually over the course um, of about a week, you will see this progression occur. The the way that rabies is transmitted between animals and then also from animals to humans is through bite wounds. So being bitten uh, by a rabid animal, that contact, that saliva uh, in through the bite wound is where that infection occurs. Uh, there are vector species and reservoir species. So basically any mammal can be a, a vector species. So any animal can, can many mammal can contract rabies. Um, and then if they bite another animal, they can pass that infection along. But there are certain species of animals in the wild that serve as reservoirs that just seem to harbor the infection. And the animals that serve as reservoirs do vary depending on what part of the United States you're in. Here in Arkansas, bats and skunks are the primary reservoir animals for rabies. So general rule of thumb, if a bat flies in your house, you probably need to really be extra careful um, if you're going to try to catch it and get it out of your house. That's the most common way that people get bitten. Um, and a lot of times people don't even realize when they get bitten by a bat. And so it's extra tragic um, when they contract rabies in that way. Because oftentimes by the time it's diagnosed, uh, it's already too far progressed for them to pursue any kind of treatment to save the person's life. Another uh, good rule of thumb is skunks are nocturnal. So if you see a skunk that is out in the middle of the day, it is, there's a good chance that skunk is not in his right mind. Um, and that very well could be a rabid skunk. And so you want to be extra cautious. Um, I also wanted to take a moment and mention that, that rabies vaccination for your pets is required by state law. This is the only vaccination in our, our companion animal species that is required by state law, regardless of whether you live in the city or out in the country. If you live in a state, then you are required to have your animal vaccinated for rabies because of the potential transmission to humans um, and the deadly consequences of such transmission. Here's just a quick overview of influenza and coronaviruses, and I'm going to um, just skip over this real quick because I need to turn it over to Dr. Rothfeld. She's going to go into influenza and coronavirus in much more detail, um, but just realize that there are a variety of different influenzas that are typically species specific, meaning they stay in their particular species. Uh, but there are times when mutations occur in the RNA of the virus that cause it to become infectious in other species. And so that's where we see these, these issues with uh, epidemics and pandemics. Um, coronavirus can do the same thing. Historically, coronavirus uh, has, has been a pretty common virus in our companion animals um, and in some of our livestock, uh, livestock species, but it typically has not caused clinical uh, disease uh, that would be considered significant. Um, and so some of you that have pets may have seen, you know, at the feed store, you can buy um, a distemper parvo vaccine that also contains coronavirus uh, for your puppy. But that coronavirus 
is similar to the coronavirus we're talking about today, but it's different. Um, and, and most people don't even vaccinate for coronavirus in dogs uh, anymore um, because it just, puppies seem to get it, they get exposed to it and they get over it and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, kittens also are exposed to coronaviruses when they're young. It's very, very common, but they get over it very quickly. Um, and so again, these self-limiting species specific viruses are not con generally considered zoonotic, but of course that conversation uh, is changing with the development of these novel human variants. And that would be the SARS, the MERS, and the COVID-19 uh, that we're gonna talk about more today. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was just the herpes viruses and the feline immunodeficiency viruses. So these viruses sound zoonotic, but usually 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not. Um, and so I never want to say never in biology. Biological life sciences, uh, you know, mutations can happen at any point. And so anything is possible. Uh, but what is common and not common? Well, herpes viruses do not commonly uh, cross over into humans. So there are a variety of different herpes viruses that are species specific that affect dogs and cats and horses and even chickens. Uh, but generally speaking, these viruses do not lend themselves to mutation uh, as easily as maybe some of the other virus families. And part of that could be because herpes virus is a DNA virus. Um, so a lot of the other viruses that are considered zoonotic are RNA viruses. And so RNA viruses are much more likely to mutate um, at a higher rate uh, than DNA viruses. The rare exception here would be in primates. There has been documentation of a herpes virus in a primate uh, crossing over um, into a human. And then feline immunodeficiency virus. Um, this one is one that is very similar to the AIDS virus um, in humans or the, the human immunodeficiency virus. So we, we literally call it feline AIDS. Um, it's a virus that cats can pass uh, back and forth between each other through bite wounds. Um, and it literally does make them immunocompromised um, just like the virus does in humans. But again, this virus is species specific. So if you have a cat that's diagnosed with feline AIDS virus, uh, you don't need to worry. It's not going to put you at risk for contracting the virus. So I just wanted to throw that out there um, because certainly after all this discussion today, uh, that would be something that, that you might come across that might make you wonder, could that infect me? Um, and, the, and the truth is with these viruses in our domesticated species, um, the likelihood of that happening is, is almost non-existent at this point. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rothfeld. Okay, okay, so, so I can take it. Right? Yes, ma'am. I need to probably turn the volume, the volume down. down. Uh, can you hear can me? You hear me? Yes. Okay, wait. How does it? How, sorry, how do you do this? So there's no feedback. Oh, maybe because you're you're not muted yet. Okay, hang on. Okay, there we go. So um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Dr. Thomas and, and Dean Kuhn and Dr. Uh, Hancox for allowing me the opportunity to um, participate in this. I've actually listened to the previous presentations and I thought they were all fantastic and I've been learning a lot myself. Um, I uh, It's been quite a while since I've been uh, uh, in the academics. I, I've been in um, multiple careers that I'll kind of discuss here in just a minute. Um, and so I've been more on the in the field side of things. And so um, presenting to an academic uh, forum was quite daunting to me. So I, um, you know, I'm going to cover some real practical stuff that we look at from a health department standpoint, but I also tried to throw in a little bit of science in there. So I probably also have um, too many slides for this so that uh, you guys are going to get the slide set at the end so you'll have all the references. Um, I really like this quote in the upper right that talks about humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war, and of these by far the greatest is and the most terrible is fever. Um, and, and the reason that I like that is because I do come from a military background um, and, you know, we talked about disease non-battle injuries, which means non-battle, so they were non-combat. 
And um, in the in the wars, if you look at the wars through the times, um, there were quite a few more casualties by diseases all the way up until World War One or World War Two was actually the the first war where there was more um, combat casualties than there were diseases, and that has to do with the advances of medicine and science and um, the the production of antibiotics and 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 you know trauma care and things like that. And so you know, but we still are fighting, and you know, there's been allusions to this. A pandemic is is fighting a war, and it's you know um, it's kind of like fighting the invisible enemy. Um, so I kind of wanted, since I've been out of academics for a while, I wanted to give you um, a little bit of a picture of who I am and and how you know why I might be qualified to discuss some of these topics. Um, so I also was an Oklahoma, Oklahoma State graduate, and I did private practice in Oklahoma in large animal practice for a few years, and then after 9/11. Um, I joined the Army, and so, and then I was an Army veterinarian for many years and, and retired and then came to the state as the state public health veterinarian. And I just kind of wanted to show you a little bit of my life because um, it it has shaped my background and, and why I feel like, you know, um, this is my passion and, and this is why I do what I do every day. So um, during my time um, in the Army, you know, our focus was on military working dog care. So the bomb and the drug dogs, those were our, our primary um uh, beneficiaries of the Army veterinarians. And then also, um, you know, we did some humanitarian work in other countries. Um, and I did a lot of food inspection, which I see that I left the food inspection uh, picture off of here. But yes, so we did a lot of sanitary control of uh, food manufacturing because, you know, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, um, you know, foodborne diseases, you know, can have serious consequences. And so what you don't want is to have you know, a whole army of people who are sick with diarrhea and vomiting because then they can't function for their, you know, their role for their mission. And so our job was also to ensure that there was a safe and wholesome food supply and water supply for um, for all military members. And then also in the middle, I wanted to, to mention that, um, so as an army veterinarian, I got assigned to the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and then I got assigned to the Arkansas Department of Health. So I was here for a couple of years. And during that time was the largest Ebola outbreak in West Africa, the first Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And it ended up being the largest outbreak as far as the numbers of casualties and deaths. Um, but there, so the picture in the middle uh, to the left is a picture of survivors that I worked with. And um, you know, and they had all experienced Ebola, and then they were now working in caring for babies that had been exposed because they were felt, you know, we felt that they might be a little bit more immune potentially to a secondary case of Ebola. So they were safer to nurse these babies back to health um, than somebody who might not have been exposed. And in the middle is my team of contact tracers. And so you guys may have heard about um, what we're doing here in Arkansas is when we detect that there's a case of COVID-19, we have people that have to go out and determine if that case, um, the person who tested positive was exposed, you know, exposed to other people. And so those are called contacts. And so we have contact tracers. And in the middle, um, the very middle of these photos are a picture of all the contact tracers that were um, tracking down contacts of Ebola cases there in Sierra Leone. Um, and as you can see, I'm getting my picture or my temperature taken by one of those um, uh, thermo point and in, in detect the temperature there. Um, and so we had border crossings where we had our temperature taken. So that's happening here in Arkansas, not ne necessarily at the borders, but in certain, like if you walk into the health department, we have to have our temperature taken um, and we have to have symptoms. You know, they ask us about our symptoms because they want to make sure that we're not, you know, um, going somewhere without uh, proper, you know, protection, wearing a mask and stuff if we have, you know, the disease. Um, and so I just briefly wanted to mention that uh, the One Health concept, which is what Dr. Thomas uh, was talking about with zoonotic diseases, and um, we do have a One Health group in Arkansas that I'm actually the chair for that. Um, we're trying to get it uh, back up and running, but it's, it's comprised of uh, veterinarians in the government sector. So we actually have a University of Arkansas Extension veterinarian. We have um, the wildlife, the game and fish veterinarian. We have the state veterinarian at the Department of Agriculture. We have myself, we have USDA, uh, we have veterinary services from USDA, wildlife services. All of us are a part of this group. Um, but, and the reason being is that, you know, the, the, there's a proof of concept that, that the One Health, we have to share 
um, an environment with these animals and with, um, you know, all of the environment that's out there and it's all interrelated. And so we can't just take care of human health and think that we can prevent, you know, diseases if we just take care of the humans. We have to take care of the animals. We have to take care of the climate and the environment. And that's where um, this uh, One Health concept comes from. And this is just another diagram I thought was really great because it showed it all from production and slaughterhouses. So we talk about the food component of things. We talk about companion animals. We talk about the chickens. There's the poultry industry and then there's the backyard poultry industry that Dr. Thomas mentioned as well. And so um, I think that's, you know, an up and coming area that lots of people want to have those. But there's also those risks. You know, I had a veterinarian friend who had her chicken. She named her Brandy and she had her inside and she actually bought diapers for her. So, you know, there's all kinds of interactions actions um, with animals that we don't even think about, but yet could have huge impact on our health if we don't do some preparation and um, be proactive at um, trying to prevent the crossover of disease. So I sent this paper out and I thought it was really good because um, it talks about, um, you know, the, the um, properties of how diseases cross over from animals to humans. And, and what was mentioned previously was that the RNA viruses and, you know, the difference is that DNA viruses have the double stranded DNA, which is very stable. RNA is, a, you know, and all these RNA viruses have a single strand of RNA and it's very unstable. And so it mutates quite frequently. And so that's why that, um, you know, they, they did a study and determined that 94% of zoonotic viruses were RNA viruses. Um, and they also determined that the wild animals were sources of zoonotic transmission um, much more than domestic animals. So it doesn't mean that our dogs and cats and stuff aren't going to be transmitting it to us, but the wild animals, it's, you know, certainly they're circulating a lot more. And a lot of that has to do with the evolution of us companionating, domesticating these animals, and then, um, you know, them uh, sort of uh, living in our environment versus uh, the environment where the wildlife lives that is separate from us and they develop a lot of things that we're not exposed to. So then we're a very naive population to wildlife diseases. Um, and the and they mentioned the vector-borne pathogens because here in Arkansas, we have a huge tick-borne uh, disease burden, and um, which is a vector-borne disease. And so, you know, they have definitely a broader host range. What they can do, what vectors can do is they can take um, one disease and, and pick it up in one species of animal. And then, you know, via their transport mechanism, whether that's flying as a mosquito or the tick falls off and then gets picked up by a different animal, um, that's how they transmit it. So those animals don't have to come in direct contact with each other. They actually, you know, it's a, it's a pathway or, um, you know, it's a delivery truck vehicle that takes, you know, your pizza to, from the pizza shop to your home, then it's a, a it's a delivery truck that's taking the disease from one a type of animal to another. So the zoonotic virus spillover is a huge deal. And as mentioned previously, that you know, it can happen by direct and indirect contact. It can happen by vectors. And, um, you know, it happens a lot in, in and around, you know, uh, agriculture, as was mentioned. Um, and then also there's high risk occupations such as veterinarians like ourselves. Um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Thomas is vaccinated for rabies and I am as well because we're in high risk occupation for that to be exposed to rabies more commonly than, than the general public. Um, and any wildlife or zoo people, um, you know, that's where the, there's, there's a higher interaction between animals and people. Uh, in, in those environments. And so there's higher risk sort of occupations or hobbies. If you're somebody who likes to go splunking into caves, you might come into contact with bats a lot more frequently. And those are just some things, you know, that we need to think about that. And this is where the whole One Health concept comes. We can't just think about ourselves. We have to think about, you know, every living organism that we're interacting with. And this is just another um, sort of uh, diagram of, of how all of that works. And, and I think the, the main point I wanted to get out on here was that, you know, we have a good surveillance system for a lot of the human transmission diseases. We don't have a good health surveillance system for animal diseases worldwide. We do have some organizations that try to conduct that, but we don't have boots on the ground surveillance 
um, in a lot of the animal diseases. And so that's where they that can happen. They could be circulating. There are veterinarians that might be, you know, treating a herd or or an individual animal for a certain disease. But as far as globally, we don't have a good way to capture that data. And so that's where I think we get caught flat-footed a, a lot of the times is that we we're not um, we're not seeing something happen before it happens, which is what this diagram um, is portraying is that, you know, there's different, there's a timeline of these diseases and cases. And so, you know, zoonotic disease, um, you know, if it starts zoonotic, it's going to start in the animals versus the reverse zoonosis. So if you see a disease in the animals, if you can intervene before the illness occurs, you can stop the cases in the animals and then even stop it from being transmitted to humans. But then if you move along that curve line, then if you intervene before the Ill, there's illness in humans, then you can slow down the progression of disease in the animals, but you're still going to get some transmission, you know, into the into the human population. And so, you know, what what we end up doing is we end up being far on the right of this curve here. And so we don't detect a lot of these zoonotic um, events until there's an outbreak in humans. And, and mainly it has to do with the fact that, that we don't have a lot of global animal surveillance programs. Um, there isn't a huge interest in it. I have a feeling that after what's going on right now, this might change and that we might have a bigger interest in, in some of these programs and in public health for sure. I think that's gonna be one of those benefits or silver linings of this, you know, and unfortunately, um, you know, we in public health we say that you know we we don't really matter until you know some crisis happens but then also if we if we're doing our job right and we prevent the crisis then you know people don't understand how hard we've been working to do that and they don't see the benefit of that until you know the crisis hits and and that's not really a good way of of um, preventing pandemics so I wanted to show this as a history of pandemics that, you know, these have been going on for ages and ages, and it's kind of tiny, but when you get a chance and get to look at the slide sheet on your own or, or take the link and go to it, you can see. But the size of these um, furry balls, I guess I'll call them, that's actually not appropriate, but the size is um, indicative of the number of deaths. And so um, the, on the right side, there's the, the large purple one, which is the, the Black Death or the bubonic plague. And so that was mentioned earlier, the Yersinia pestis. Down on the bottom um, to the right is uh, where COVID-19 is currently. And it is um, ahead of SARS and MERS already and swine flu, which is the 2009 H1N1 um, outbreak that we had. And so where this is gonna go, I can't tell you, this is changing on a daily basis. Um, and so, you know, that may move forward. Um, unfortunately it will, I don't know if it will surpass the next one in line or not, but um, you know, the numbers are, are, we're right in the middle of this and uh, I don't see an end to it anytime soon. So I liked yesterday's presentation where, um, you know, we, we talked about the mapping of and the geography and how it pertains to the spread of pandemics. And so I had already had this in my um, presentation yesterday. And so I was really pleased to, to be able to tie it back in that, you know, um, it, it wasn't until humanity started, you know, global trade that these diseases got the ability to spread the way they do. So essentially, we become the vectors um, of these diseases. We are the, uh, the spreaders of them by our travel. And that's exactly what happened with COVID-19 because we saw where it started and we saw where it spread. And you can, there are maps out there that you can see that where it starts from the very beginning. And, you know, they put little dots on there as it spreads across the, um, across the world. Um, and there's actually a game called um, Plague Inc. I think is the name of it. I'm not plugging it necessarily, but my kids have played it. And, and it's kind of basically you create your own pandemic and you can choose your um, choose your your uh, symptoms and how it acts and where it starts. And, and then you you basically become Dr. Evil and and send your plague across the world. And, it, and it's really true to life. And um, and now it's almost creepy thinking about how they played it, and it actually really did happen in real life. Um, so so much that, that it just seems like somebody 
potentially created this, which I'm not saying they did, but um, it's it's just kind of crazy. You could see how it just travels from one country to the next. And this is just showing you that the urbanization and spread of disease, you know, as, as we grow and we've seen this happen because what we've seen is that here in Arkansas, our numbers have stayed low. And we're assuming that a lot of that has to do with our social distancing, which is just natural, not just the fact that we're telling everybody to stay apart, but the fact that we are quite rural and that people aren't crammed together like they are in New York City. You know, and unfortunately, um, I, I've been to New York City and I love this city, but it is just, um, it, it has the perfect environment for a spread of a respiratory disease you know, with the people crammed in there. And there, and there are quite a few cities like that all over this world. And, um, and, and unfortunately, um, they are going to have to take a lot more uh, stricter actions to prevent it because of their close proximity to each other. Um, and so that's just the unfortunate truth of, of urbanization that was discussed previously, is that the closer we get to each other, the closer we get to animals, the, the higher the risk is of transmission between the two um, for, you know, for diseases. And so, you know, they've compared this a lot to the flu and, and it's it's like comparing apples and oranges to each other. Um, and also you can't really compare it to the general flu every year because we are in the middle. We just got started. We don't know when it's going to end. So you can't really compare the numbers of cases and the numbers of deaths because also at the beginning of an outbreak, um, what you see and what you count are the most severe cases. And so what you don't see are those less severe cases, the ones that don't go to the hospital or don't go see their doctor. They sit at home. They may continue going to work sick or they may be asymptomatic like we've discussed now with COVID-19 where they're not even ill, but they're still spreading the disease. So it's really hard to look at, at uh, fatality rates in that because what we don't know is we can't take, we don't know the denominator. We might know we don't even know the numerator. So, um, you know, we're just taking a stab at it. So I, I caution you to use the, the numbers and the statistics that are out there and to look at them, um, you know, with a, a grain of salt that, that you know, these are all estimates. And, and especially in the middle of an outbreak, everything is an estimate. We really don't know how this is gonna pan out at the end. Um, but, you know, and that's the thing, too, is the difficulty with preparing for a pandemic is we don't know which of these viruses will emerge until they do. And like I said, you know, if we had better ways to detect them in the animals before the people, then we could slow that curve. But unfortunately, we're still a very reactive society. So a lot of the past pandemics were influenzas. Um, and, and, you know, and so that's the one that we've all that we've been preparing for. That's the platform that we've used is the influenza virus. And also the reason is because the influenza virus itself is a highly uh, mutative virus. It'll, it'll mutate very frequently. Um, and that's why we get different shots every year is because they have to develop new vaccines uh, to adapt to how the virus mutates. It mutates in the middle of a season. And there's so many different um, types of them that I'll show you on another slide that, you know, it, it's hard to know which one is it going to be that's going to mutate into the more highly virulent one, the one that crosses over from animals to humans. You know, that's also a guessing game. And so, uh, but we do know that there are quite a few um, avian influences and some other zoonotic influences from uh, specifically pigs that have, you know, been transmitted from those species, and like Dr. Uh, Thomas mentioned earlier, they're very highly species specific until they mutate and they get to this point where they can cross over. And unfortunately, what we think is that um, pigs are very capable of allowing for the influenza viruses to reassort um, from different species into a new strain. So a pig that is exposed to a bird that has a bird flu, but then is also exposed to a human with a human influenza, then that virus, those viruses may get into the cells and then they do a reassortment. And then that leads to antigenic, you know, drift and shift and that changes um, how they react. And so sometimes it might make them less virulent. It might make them so that, you know, it, it might be a bad mutation and it, it turns them into something that doesn't work in any species. But then it also might go the opposite and it, and, and it changes them so that they become much more dangerous and then they can also infect other species. And so that's the concern that we have with the intermingling of, of species and the intermingling of these flu viruses. 
And this is just a table of, of the past four influenza pandemics. Um, certainly the 1918 Spanish flu is what a lot of people are, are talking about these days, but it shows you, and I think in a previous discussion, they talked about the r naught, which is the estimated reproductive number, and you can see in the middle column. Um, so for 1918 Spanish flu, or H1N1, it was, um, the r naught was like, it varied from 1.2 to 3.0. So um, the, uh, you know, and so right now what we're looking at for the r naught of COVID is, is probably around that range a little bit higher is what we're estimating currently. You know, the Asian, there was the Asian flu and then the Hong Kong flu. Now they named those from the location of where they, um, where they originated, you know, but now we, um, you know, it's not, it's not politically correct necessarily to be naming those flus that way. And, and a lot of it has to do with our, our previous discussion, um, you know, talking about uh, the culture and how um, the stigma of, of that can be um, devastating. And so what we don't want to do is to isolate a certain population and, and blame it all on that population. And so I agree, but, you know, in, in history, in medical history, those are the names that they've given to those flus. And then in 2009, we had the H1N1 variant, which was a swine type flu variant um, that erupted and um, it had a lower R naught, but there was, um, you know, quite a few mortalities as well along with it. And the interesting thing about it was it hit the children and young adults the same as the 1918 Spanish flu. They were uh, more at risk, it felt, we felt like. So this slide I probably should have put before that because we were talking about the H1s and the N1s and the you know H5s and N7s and things like that. And so um, briefly, the, the influenza, there's three types. There's the A, B, and C. Influenza A is the most common. It's also the one, the only one that animals can have. Um, this past season, the Arkansas Department of Health determined that we did have a B version. It was called B Victoria. It was also circulating. In fact, it was circulating more than the influenza A type, um, which is a little bit unusual. But we do monitor that at the health department. Um, but this is just showing you the different species um, that can be infected with those different types. And basically, the H and the Ns are... Um, antigens, they're surface proteins on the influenza virus, and they we've just named them with a letter and a number, um, and then they vary. And that's what the vaccine is trying to, to attack, is, is we have to figure out, you know, which of those surface proteins can we um, provide, you know, produce a vaccine against. And so bird flus, um, you know, is kind of the, the layman's term for avian influenzas, and they can be classified into low path and high path. And basically what that means is that a low path avian influenza is where um, it goes undetected because a lot of them are asymptomatic and it's very, um, you know, very mild illness. But sometimes low path can mutate to become a high path. And that's where we have huge morbidity and mortality. And so you may have, um, like here we, we have poultry uh, farms where we have barns with, you know, several thousand birds. And um, you know so they may lose the whole barn. The whole barn may die, um, and that and that's how serious it can get. The high path strain can get, and the problem is is that high path strain can then mutate and and infect humans as it has, and and it's been proven to show that we've had human infections with these high path avian influenza strains, and that's where our concern about the pandemic comes from with avian influenzas. And so the OIE, which is the World Organization for Animal Health, it's kind of like the counterpart to the WHO on the human side. They have a website where you can go track real, real time what outbreaks are currently going on. And I bring this up because if you can see over in the left side on the map, we have a high path avian influenza outbreak currently in North Carolina. And it was in Turkey's. And that's going on um, right now. And I mean, I don't know, I'm sure they've contained it, but unfortunately, um, you know, it is there and there's the concern. Well, what, you know, the concern now is, well, we have this high path avian influenza in this area where there's also COVID cases. So, you know, number one, if somebody goes in sick, is it going to be influenza or is it going to be COVID? Well, a lot of the practices for medically managing that patient don't change between the two, but it's important to know because they have a little bit of different transmission uh, properties, a little bit, you know, we, we believe that the SARS 
virus that's causing COVID-19 is more infectious. Um, it causes a different disease pattern. You know, there may be different, there may be, you know, a little bit different nuances. And then, um, but also could we have uh, a, an influenza outbreak in addition to COVID, which would greatly strain the public health resources. Um, and so that's kind of frightening. And, you know, so the big deal about this is that, you know, when they have a high path avian influenza outbreak, there's, um, you know, a lot of depopulation has to go on because there's no way to control it in these flocks. There's absolutely no way other than to cull these animals. And so, you know, it can be quite um, stressful on the businesses that own them, on the people that have to work with them, um, on trade you know, international trade and the economy of the country because then they have to notify the OIE um, and then, you know, they may be banned from exporting their product and things like that. So it has very serious consequences and it's being, you know, at least that is one of the diseases that is being globally surveilled um, right now a lot better than any of the others. And so the, um, you know, in the face of all of these pandemic influenzas, uh, you know, the, the U.S. And the, and the World Health Organization have developed, you know, pandemic preparedness platforms. And uh, because, you know, they say they, that viruses respect no borders, especially with the global trade now, um, and that everybody must work together, you know, the rich and the poor, and that, you know, everybody must have access to this. And a lot of this also has to do with food security. And so not just food safety, or human health safety, but food security, um, as in these animals that may be affected, are also um, a source of protein for, you know, um, population for their diet. And so it's very important to conserve that um, as, you know, there are a lot of food insecure areas in this world. So then the question is, are we ready for the next pandemic? This was brought up by the uh, manager of WHO's Global Influenza Program. And the statement, I like this, it said, another pandemic caused by a new influenza virus is a certainty. But we do not know when it will happen, what virus strain it will be, and how severe the disease will be. But then this happened. So it was an influenza. It was the coronavirus. And as previously mentioned, there we have a lot of coronaviruses in animals and humans. In fact, the corona, there's lots of coronaviruses circulating that are responsible for our, our the human, uh, the cold, just the regular cold that people get. And so, um, but it, the difference is that the coronaviruses that have um, mutated recently. And so, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about SARS-CoV, which was the original for, you know, SARS-CoV-1 now. And then Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS-CoV, um, was another outbreak. And then now we have the SARS-CoV-2 named because it's very similar to the virus that caused SARS-CoV-1, more similar than it is to the virus that causes uh, MERS-CoV, which actually is still um, ongoing transmission in, in the Middle East. Um, and, and the reason they're named coronaviruses is because of that halo or crown-like corona appearance under the microscope. And so that helps you, you know, remember um, why they're named that. And so let's talk a little bit about SARS. So the first severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, SARS-CoV, was uh, in 2003. And it really only went from 2003 to 2004. And, um, you know, the case fatality rate they determined from it was 10%. So, and it was spread a lot through close contact in, in healthcare and household settings, which is exactly what's going on right now. Um, and it uh, was detected in bats with the intermediate host that they suspect was the palm civet or the raccoon dog. Um, because in China, they um, have a lot of live wild animal markets, so they call them wet markets. And so they um, they serve a lot of wildlife, and, um, and that's a great mixing, melting pot, petri dish, if you want to call it, for, for diseases. And so they tracked it back down. Now, um, it, they are just, you know, assuming based on the data and the epidemiology that this is probably what happened. But there still is no proof that this is what happened. Um, and, and, you know, it was responsible for, for 8,000 cases and 774 deaths in 25 countries. And if you think about those numbers, you know, I mean... Uh, Mississippi is at those numbers right now, is a state, and this was the worldwide cases, and it was a huge deal. 
Um, many of you were probably quite young then, but you know the others have been around and, and we remember that this was a really big and scary event. And if you look at those numbers and compare them to today's numbers, they're nothing. And so, um, you know, I, it, it just reminds us that we should not take for granted that this is um, what we're experiencing right now is unprecedented. And then there's Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS-CoV. And the numbers there, if you look at those, the numbers of lab confirmed cases are much lower, but they did have a higher death rate. So their case fatality rate for MERS-CoV is 35%, which is higher. But what they felt like is that this disease is much less transmissible. So they would, you know, I don't, I don't have the R-naught um, right in front of me, but the R-naught for this disease is, would be lower than the R-naught for the current SARS and the previous SARS. Um, but the case fatality rates are much lower. But like I said, you have to take those, you know, those case fatality rates are only based on what we know. And so if there were quite a few more MERS um, mild diseases or asymptomatic diseases, that would make that case fatality rate go down if we were to know that information, but we don't at this point. They also think that they've detected it in bats, but they found it in um, these one humped camels or dromedary camels, which are quite common in the Middle East. They use them for meat and fiber and milk, and um, they even drink the urine. And so, for you know, it has special medicinal properties. And so, they have a lot of direct contact with camels. Um, and like I said, there are still cases ongoing in 2020. It's just much less uh, lower transmission rate than the regular SARS. And so, we don't, we didn't see it spread. We did see it spread. South Korea had their own little outbreak of it. And we did have cases that entered the United States. But what we didn't see is it going from person to person. And so I like this quote that's uh, that was from um, Dr. Osterholm at the University of Minnesota. And, um, you know, he's talking about that the real danger is when they start spreading between people and trigger a pandemic. And he says, we're now at the second level of concern, he says, because MERS is not just a dangerous virus in animals, but is spilling over to the human population again and again. The third level could happen tomorrow. And it did. And so this is where we're at. And this was pulled from this morning where we have um, worldwide almost four and a half million cases and close to 300,000 global deaths. And so if you compare those numbers to the previous SARS and the MERS outbreaks, they certainly are and have well surpassed them. And they are approaching the influenza numbers. And like I said, we're right in the middle of this still. So we don't know where this is going to go yet. And then I just wanted to point out that the Department of Health has a website where you can get all of this Arkansas specific information. And then so we have our own map here. If you haven't seen it yet, it, it has counties and um, you can in the live version on the web, you can hover over the counties and it'll give you the numbers of cases um, and things there. But it shows you that we've had over 4000 cases with only 97 deaths here. And I say that, you know, not being disrespectful to those 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 deaths, but to say that our numbers are remaining quite low in comparison to the rest of the United States and the rest of the world. So I think that right now we are doing well, and I hope that we can continue to stay on this path. So how do you compare these viruses together? Well, the the Wuhan, or as it's labeled here, this was um, first, this was reported from January 22nd. So the numbers don't, you know, look at those numbers of the COVID there because they're quite different now. But it just shows you, you know, when it was first reported, where it started, um, and then how, you know, how was it transmitted and, and which countries were affected. Um, and this, you know, there's a lot of words here, but I thought this was important in a lead into the animal component. So, you know, they say that the issue of the need to evaluate companion animals and their status with regards to SARS-CoV-2 was first raised on January 29th when a member of the senior expert team stated on Chinese state television that pet owners should take extra care of their animals because the virus moves between mammals. If your animals come into contact with the outbreak or people infected with a the virus, then your pets should be put in quarantine because the epidemic spreads between mammals. Therefore, we should take precaution against other mammals. So there was no scientific data to present it that would support that statement. But nonetheless, it prompted a severe public response that resulted in many pet dogs and cats being killed and thousands being abandoned. So there's been lots of reports and um, the heartbreaking of what happened with the animals in China. Um, and, and a lot of it had to do with the fact of the unknown. And so, you know, that's where I think it's really important in public health that we 
discover, we, we state what is not known and, and we don't make subjective comments about things. And so it, it's not, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying we don't know at this point, you know, we just need to use caution, but we shouldn't, you know, make statements if we don't have scientific data to back it up. And so then what happened later, a month later, was they had a dog that tested weak positive for this. What they didn't know was, was it environmental contamination because the dog lived with, um, you know, a, a person that, you know, maybe was shedding it. And so those are a lot of the questions that we're still trying to discover in animals is, is what what is actually going on? Are they becoming infected? Are they mounting immune responses? Or are they just, you know, is it just environmental contamination of the virus, which can happen because that's how viruses work. They could be living on something, but not actually infecting the cells. And so, you know, it's all dependent on how their machinery operates. And so now I pulled this from today because it actually had changed um, in, the la in this last week. And these are the animals that have been reported to the OIE. So the, um, which is, uh, it started with the two dogs in China and then we had a cat in Belgium. And then you guys probably heard about the tiger and lion in the Bronx Zoo. Um, and then we had two cats in New York city. And then recently we've had two mink farms in the Netherlands with another um, couple of cats in France, Spain, and Germany. And so this, this is changing daily because one of these was just reported yesterday. So here's the, so I don't have a lot of information to provide on, you know, or proof to provide what is going on here, but this is just a, a snapshot of the beginning, I feel like. Um, and so right now, it, you know, the assumption is that these animals are being infected by their humans. So this would be reverse zoonosis. The epidemiology is not telling us that animals are, are uh, infecting us back because certainly in the United States, we have so many pets and we have a lot of people that have been sick. And what we're not seeing is a lot of infection going back from the animals to people. And this came out from the Dutch human vet group after the mink, um, you know, that there's there's no evidence that companion animals play a significant role in spreading the, the disease. So there's no justification in taking measures against them, which may compromise their welfare. And I think that's an important take home message for this. Um, and that, you know, that zoonotic transmission can't be excluded, but that, you know, the impact on human health is negligible. And so here in the, um, you know, I talked about the OIE, which is the World Organization. So here in, um, in Arkansas, I am, I will be taking over as president for the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians this summer. Um, and so we, it's a group of all of us state public health veterinarians, as the name alludes. And then uh, we work with the CDC regularly, um, their One Health Division, and we work with the USDA, the US FDA. The National Assembly of State Animal Health Officials, which is the group that the state vets work with. And so the state vet is at the agriculture department. The state public health vet, which is myself, is at the health department. State vet works on animal diseases. The public health vet works on animal diseases that cross over into humans. So the zoonotic diseases, which is what I'm responsible for. And we have um, developed a testing algorithm for animals because, you know, we just like in humans, you can't just test without a plan. You need to know what you're going to do with those test results. You need to understand what those test results mean, because with the test methodologies that we have these days, they can be very specific and sensitive, but not at the same time all the time and they need to be validated and so with something new we've got new tests out there and we don't know you know we don't know if they if you get a negative test are you really negative or was it tested at the wrong time will you be positive tomorrow um were you positive last week and now the test is negative because you don't have the virus you know in your nasal cavity things like that so we've developed this testing algorithm that you have here. And in the sa um, sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip over, you know, a lot of the testing because I wanted to get to um, a couple of these other items in the animals. So in the U or yeah, the USDA site will list um, the animals that we have tested in the United States. So this is different than what I showed you earlier, which was the OIE, the world cases. And you may have seen the the news, uh, the video article about the 
pug that tested positive in North Carolina. Um, that was actually done in a research project where they were doing household studies. And so they were looking at homes where um, people had tested positive and if they had pets, they were testing the pets. And this, this particular pug um, was one that was very close with his family and he licked their plates and he licked their faces a lot. And so, you know, right now it's not listed in the USDA test because it hasn't been confirmed. So it's only as far as you know, the government considers it presumptive positive. It was done in a research study and it hasn't been confirmed at the USDA. And once it does, it has to be reported to the OIE. Um, this is a, just a chart that shows out of based on some research and actual cases, you know, which species we feel like are susceptible to the virus, which ones, you know, what kind of a, an infection, did they actually have clinical signs? Did they seroconvert, which means that we can detect antibodies, which actually means they were infected versus just contamination, um, you know, where they might've cleared the virus and didn't, you know, get infected. And so, and can they transmit it to other animals and the types of data or the types of evidence that, that was collected on it? And so our basic um, tenet is that, you know, if you socially distance your pet the same way you do from, you know, socially distancing yourself from people, that there's no chance you can bring this virus into the household. And so we just want to reiterate that, that, you know, you need to take the same precautions with your pet that you do with other people. And I really like this Worms and Germs blog, so I, I put it up there because Dr. Scott Weiss um, is one of the co-partners of this site, and he gives some very basic information with, you um, very sound science backed uh, evidence to prove, you know, his statements. And so I really like, I follow it and um, I, I encourage, you know, if you're interested in to check that out. So our key messages about the role of animals in COVID is that there's no evidence that animals play a significant role. And based on limited information, the risk of animals spreading it to people is still low. We're still learning about it, but it appears that it can be spread to animals in certain situations. And there are further studies needed to understand if and how they could be affected. And I I have a whole lot more slides on these studies, but I think in the interest of time, because we've come up against the time, you guys are going to be getting these slides and, and, and you can take a look at, at those because I really delve into the um, the role that bats play in a lot of these diseases. And I hear that we are going to have a wildlife specialist specializing in bats. And so he can probably cover that more than I can because I'm certainly not a virologist and I'm not a an expert in um, in, in wildlife. And so I, I will just let you guys take a look at those slides. And if um, we can talk more about that in our session with the small group next time. So uh, that was with fantastic. that, I thank you. You guys really rocked, guys it. Really rocked it. Thank you. And um, uh, wonderful information in the slides and so beautifully delivered. So I want to thank both Dr. Thomas and Dr. Rothfeld for these stunning presentations.